Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube. Covering Knowledge 15. Brought to you by ServiceNow. Okay, welcome back everyone. You're watching theCUBE, uh, SiliconANGLE, Wikibon's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise, get all the data share with you. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. We're live in Las Vegas for ServiceNow Knowledge 15, hashtag No15. Our next guest, Brian Clark, former executive director of ITS, RMIT University. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, John. So we're going to get down and dirty, get nerdy, get talk about the tech. Um, ServiceNow, we had all the executives on, all the messaging. <laughs> so, bottom line. The platform solid, what's your take on the platform? What's going on under the covers? Give us a take on what's on the platform, what makes it unique, why, why is all this traction happening? Why are everyone so happy? Why is everyone partying on the beach last night? What's <laughs> going on with ServiceNow? Give us the uh, take. I think the reasons for partying on the beach and why the platform's so solid may well be different. But I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a software engineer by background, so I spent 10 years being paid to write code, so uh, I am a nerd, um, and, and that's a term of endearment for me. And one of the things that as we were going through the selection process at the university, that really impressed me was the strength of the platform. I think it's been really well architected. As a software engineer, I'm typically pretty skeptical of applications. In fact, I think most applications suck. Um, and I was really impressed as we went through the evaluation uh, with the strength of the platform and the, and the amount of capability and functionality that ServiceNow is adding because we had looked at the platform 18 months before and seeing it 18 months later and how much it actually developed and changed was, was quite impressive. The software's damn good, it really is impressive. Yeah. What are the parameters of software that doesn't suck? <laughs> it's a good question. I think first and foremost, it actually needs to be pretty easy to use. Um, so I'm a big fan of, of user experience and, uh, and, and that's very trendy now thanks to yeah. all the work that Apple's done, quite yeah. honestly, in the last decade. Um, but if I go back to my first experiences as a developer, um, I designed an application from the inside out, my first sort of real application build. Started with the data model and sort of worked out all the dynamics of how it should operate from my perspective as an engineer. I took it out and showcased it with a set of users and showed them the screens and I was really proud of this work. I was quite happy, I was uh, 23, 24 years old. And they started asking questions about, could you change it to work like this and could it do that? And none of that made sense to me because it wasn't the data model, but it was actually how they worked. And so I sat down with them after that and said, tell me what you guys actually do and how you actually do it. And actually on the flight back from that trip, redesign the entire application from their perspective back in. And so that's for me the start of software that doesn't suck is you start with the user. And it's one of the things that I think ServiceNow has gotten right in terms of the way people work. A lot of um, application platforms in this space come out of a BPM heritage. They're sort of services yeah. talking to services as opposed to humans working with humans. And I think that's a big differentiator. The design constraints now. are interesting. In the old days it was, okay, here's the methodology, waterfall, whatever it was, and here's the criteria, bandwidth could be limited, it could be screen, all that stuff has got to be built out from scratch. Now you have completely connected networks and people with phones. So now you, you have now an agile mindset. This is the cloud, right? So, so give us your take on that whole cloud native born in the cloud, and the benefits to a developer, this DevOps mindset, and, and as an engineer, software engineer, what are the table stakes going forward in the future? Does DevOps become easy to use? Easy yeah. ops, easy DevOps? Yeah, look, there's a couple of questions in there. I mean, if I, if I go back to sort of the evolution of, we've gotten to a point where uh, bandwidth is pretty, pretty inexpensive. I won't, I won't say it's free yet, but it's pretty inexpensive. Um, the proliferation of mobile devices, mobility is ubiquitous. Um, so you've got a new environment, you've got a new playing field. And I think that the opportunity that affords us is the ability to quickly roll out capability to the, uh, to, to the end users. So we're talking about development in terms of weeks and months instead of what used to be months and months and years. And so I think that really changes the game for organizations. In terms of, in terms of DevOps, I mean, I think that is the new, the new frontier for you know, software engineers. So if I look at software engineering, it's moved to managing large scale environments and, and writing code to do that as opposed to necessarily writing a lot of code to provide end user functionality and, and platforms like ServiceNow allow you to flip that. So I got to ask you the large scale question because this is, this is great, we love these conversations. <laughs> large scale is about scale out but now you got scale up. All this goodness is going on in the cloud so it's large scale 
computer science comes into play, distributed computing theory, et cetera. Um, then you got other new real-time needs, right? So you got large scale combined with real time. You saw some of the stuff, Angular, the they're ready stuff in Angular, you got Node, you have asynchronous stuff, you, and this is the new normal, right? You know, waiting versus polling and web sockets, which they, they use, but take us through your mindset of that environment where you got large scale, which is good, you always turn up the cloud, but like real time is also not trivial. So what's your take on that as a, as a developer and, and looking at the ServiceNow platform, this notion of real time, what does it mean? How hard is it to do? What are some of the benefits? Well, I, I guess being a bit of an old school software engineer, it always surprises me, um, some of the younger kids, I'll call them, they're coming through that don't necessarily understand all the complexity that sits behind that. I mean, you know, I was talking to a developer the other day about sockets, and they had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. And, <laughs> you know, we were in one of the labs, I was nerding out this week at, uh, at the conference, and one of the labs, they were describing the idea of synchronous and asynchronous. And as a software engineer, I was really quite surprised that we we're having that kind of conversation. But the reality is, they don't have to worry about that stuff anymore. And the, the reason they don't have to worry about that is because that's all been built into the platform. So not just, not just ServiceNow, this isn't a, you know, we love ServiceNow commercial. In the cloud in general, engineers of my generation have been solving those problems saying you don't have to worry about that anymore. And I think that allows them to focus on the real time and, the, and again, back to that user experience. User, yeah, back to the problem, user problem. Inside yeah, exactly. out kind of thing. Yeah, so and I think it also allows us to specialize. So you don't have to know 32 different technologies to bring functionality to market. So what's going on at RMIT? Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. Um, you're, you have the title of Transformation Projects. That's kind of interesting. You know, we always, I always like to look at run the business, grow the business, transform the business. You're in that sort of third category, which means that you've got a small budget. Uh, <laughs> uh, but take, take us through the organization, more efficient. kind of what your role is, sure. what's, what's happening in your you know, business, if you will. Yeah, if, so if we go back a little bit, I, was, uh, I spent about almost four years as the CIO at RMIT, and, and one of the projects that I picked up outside of, of technology was um, transforming the admissions process. And so uh, when we looked at it, I was quite surprised. I come out of banking. I spent 10 years in financial services. Um, and I was quite surprised at how manual uh, the university was. And, and, and it's not just RMIT, um, universities in general. I've spent a lot of time in the last uh, four or five months looking at other universities who have exactly the same problem. Uh, there's a lot of paper that moves around these organizations. As a student, uh, the experience uh, to apply to RMIT only uh, four years ago was that you needed to fill out a paper-based application. Uh, and still, many universities today, all of their administrative processes are literally fill out a, a form, a paper form, sign it, and bring it in. Not, you can't even scan it in some cases and email it, you actually physically bring it in. And so we looked at that as a fairly big problem. One, it's an operational problem. It creates a, a lot of costs that you don't necessarily need in the organization. But it, it's also a brand problem. If you're, the, if you're RMIT University and you're a global university of technology and design, and the way you interact with your customers is on paper, that's not really delivering the brand promise. And so we, we realized that we need to solve that problem from both perspectives. Okay, so, so, so you went from CIO role to this transformation role, and, and what have you been working on? Yeah, so one of the things that I, I saw at the beginning of, of last year, a real opportunity in the higher ed sector, because like I said, most of the universities if not all the universities in Australia have this same problem. There's a deregulation going on in the Australian market. Um, it's been a heavily regulated education environment and that has been loosening quite a lot over the last few years. Price deregulation is coming through. And so I looked out and said, I can help these organizations. So um, I just had a conversation with my boss and said, look, I really want to set up a business that's focused on helping universities improve the student life cycle, helping them improve the student experience and take cost out of the back office, right? And so um, I made that transition out of the CIO role and, and consult back to RMIT as the project director for this global admissions project. And so that, I've got that, that takes up a few days of my, of my week, really sort of seeing that through. And to be honest, it's a real personal thing for me because I started that journey about a year and a half ago with the university and I really want to see it through for them. But the other half of my week is spent looking at other universities and, and helping them solve the same problem. Well, it's, it's not unique to Australia, I can tell you. Was, uh, <laughs> you know, I, my daughter's a freshman in college and boy, what a complex matrix. I don't know if it's like that in California, but I mean, it's, just even pay a bill. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. It, it, so many portals that I have to go through and passwords, and it's, it's really a frustrating experience. <laughs> now, it's really funny. It's funny you say that because we, we spent time when I was at RMIT really looking at um, how students pay bills. And we first of all looked at the invoice that we gave these students. And 
No one could understand. No, none of us in this side of the university could understand what the actual fee was and how much they needed to pay and by when. And so we completely redesigned that. We took a really commercial sort of mindset to it. And if you looked at it, it looked just like any bill that you would get from a commercial provider, which is pretty clear. Here are the services you got. Here's how much you owe. Yeah. Here's when you need to pay. Easy to understand, transparent. Yeah. You know, it doesn't take up 40 minutes for me to figure <laughs> out. Uh, I actually know the CIO on Twitter and I've had some interactions with her. Should I tell her to call ServiceNow? I mean, <laughs> what, what role does ServiceNow play in that transformation? Look, I think there's an opportunity for ServiceNow. At RMIT, we did inside our student management system, which is a, another product. Um, but definitely, I've been talking to a couple of other universities who have exactly this problem, and I think ServiceNow will, could, could play a good role in that. So wh where, where should people start? Uh, solving this problem. That's an interesting I point. I mean, probably not with the technology, I presume. No, definitely yeah. not with the technology. Yeah. I, my view is always start with the student experience. Um, I've been doing quite a bit of reading in, uh, in the last few months about customer effort, so there's a lot of work coming out of the corporate executive board about, you know, if you look back four or five years ago, we talked about delighting our customers. If you delight their cus your customers, they'll stay. You get this great sort of loyalty effect. The reality is, A, it's really hard to know how to delight them, and B, the research is now showing they may not be so loyal even if you do delight them. But if you stuff them around and you make it really hard for them to pay a bill or really hard for them to, to, do, some, <laughs> to do some interaction, uh, they will leave. And you, you and I have probably had that same experience yeah. as a customer. Yeah, credit goes to hell in a handbasket recently. <laughs> so, so let's talk about use cases. One of the things Fred Letty was talking on, on theCUBE here uh, yesterday was, um, it was kind of around the Internet of Things question, but it isn't, that's not related to the question I want to ask, which is, the old processes that are being, the workflows that are being automated and, and, and disrupted by ServiceNow customers are old and cobwebbed. They're all like old, and they were designed around capabilities back then. I kind of alluded to that earlier. But with the Internet of Things and now mobile, new use cases are emerging where you could actually reconstruct workflows in that. So can you give it a, share some insight into um, new things that have, new capabilities that have emerged in your world where you can jump on it and where that innovation is. Because there's, there's two things. There's the, let's reboot and reorchestrate workflows. And then there's actual innovation on top, right? So, yeah. so talk about those new yeah. capabilities where the ServiceNow developer could jump on. Well, and, and I think, unfortunately, if you look at higher ed, um, the problems that most commercial organizations had 10 or 15 years ago are the problems they're facing today. So you don't have to be particularly innovative to solve those. But you're spot on about, about workflow. And, and there's an opportunity to completely redesign it. And um, we have a couple of people working for us that are Lean Six Sigma, Six Sigma experts. And so we start with, what bits of this can we completely do away with? And let's, let's actually redesign from the ground up. And I do think that ServiceNow as a, as a strong workflow engine in particular can allow you to bring, automate that pretty quickly. Um, if I looked outside, of high, and I think it's kind of, for higher education, it's a bit of too walk, many targets with, walk before you run sort of <laughs> stuff. Um, in terms of innovation, look, I think that idea of Internet of Things and, and um, devices being able to log information and, and, and kick off, automatically kick off workflows without human intervention, I think um, at the end of the day, any workflow has got to start with some human doing something. But the, when you start connecting devices, the devices can start doing that for you. And so, so, so that's disrupting other workflows that absolutely. have no connections. Absolutely. Okay, I got to ask the nerd question for you. What's the coolest thing you've seen here at the event? Obviously, a lot of labs, uh, a lot of people talking in the hallways, a lot of sessions. What's the coolest thing you've seen? Yeah, I guess so far the the move to Angular JS as as a nerd really really <laughs> makes a difference. I mean, <laughs> we've done a lot of work in the web front end because of user experience. User experience is so important to us, um, and so I can tell you all the web dev guys that are working with us are very excited about. All right, that. let me jump in here. So <laughs> you talk about Angular all the time. Uh, yeah. You get this crowd chat application, and John's like really you know excited about Angular JS. You've mentioned it, Fred Luddy. Let's back it up. Why is Angular JS so so cool? What is it? Why is it so important? Yeah, well, this is going to, you're going to stretch the li limit of my, my nerddom here. Um, well, John can jump in. <laughs> <laughs> look, at, at the end of the day, there's a couple of things, right? So if you look at Jelly, which has sort of been the sort of driving force behind yeah. CMS, it is an older technology, and, and we're not seeing people uh, come out of university who've got a lot of Jelly experience. Jelly XML. So as a manager, yeah. I go, well, I can, I can pick up Angular JS web dev guys right off the street. Uh, there's a little bit of debate raging between Angular and some other one, and to be honest, there's always been those over the last 20 years that sure. I've been involved in technology. Um, but uh, it also is about, it does get a little bit into the design pattern that you can apply. And so the ability to, uh, I guess, make a better sort of uh, user interface design that sits on top of ServiceNow and its CMS yeah. is, is the one bootstrap of the case. thing was awesome. It's Sorry, bootstrap. Cool. Bootstrap would have been yeah. But we see bootstrap for us. We um, we've done a lot of work with bootstrap over the yeah. last two or three years. So I was very pleased to hear yeah, that the bootstrap was coming in as a, as well. I mean, responsive design. 
literally had arguments about this um, for a year inside uh, inside RMIT um, before the people relented and we put our responsive design into the web and uh, it's it's gotten great. Yeah, we're, we're Angular, Dave. I, you know, I was showing Pat when Pat Casey came off the keynote. I showed him our our product. I was showing some of the service now. Our new product we're going to release called Crowd Pages, and it's all written in Angular and it's so real time. It's so great. It's so easy. Um, it, and he's like, he goes, that's good software. I go, you did this? But yeah, we did that. Yeah, <laughs> our team, we have a great engineering team, all DevOps guys. But this, this is the new culture, the younger generation. Mm. This is what they want. They don't want to deal with caching and polling in a real time environment. And certainly with notifications and things going on in ServiceNow's world, this is a beautiful step okay. in that direction. To me, I think Angular speaks to Fred's, you know, and team's vision of, uh, you know, hey, this is the right environment that people want because the, the user experience has to be real time. And we talk about res responsive design. You talk about the, the, a, web, a website that's going to work well on, on any size screen, mm. right? Versus a native app? Or yeah, is more it so based versus just, um, uh, uh, one of the things that if you go back sort of five well, versus years Versus a crappy website. Well, versus <laughs> a, a website that you, you end up with two, right? So you end up with the desktop version and you end up with the mobile version and then you end up managing content between the two. Which and, is so common today, right? I mean, and and, and that's, that's kind of the design pattern that was, you know, before responsive design came along, before things like Bootstrap came along, that's what people did. They built one for the web, for desktop, and they built one for mobile, and yep. then you had to manage the manage the. So team. when should you develop a, a mobile app? Because there are there are use cases. You mean for native, that. Mobile. Na yeah, yeah, native, native mobile? Native mobile. Yeah. 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 Look, I mean, I, I I don't have particularly strong views on this. Other than I mean, I think the industry's kind of spoken on this. If you need uh, a lot of the device functionality and, and some of the things we saw yeah. yesterday in the uh, in the keynote around the sort of coming version of the ServiceNow app, being able to use the device, being able to use a lot of the location information. And again, it comes back to me to driving that user experience. Right? Camera. It, it just, know, native, exactly, yeah. and lo location services and things oh. like that are allow, allow the device to start to do some of the stuff as well. Yeah, we have some data on this. One of the things, our opinion on this is pretty clear. If you need the device, you go native. If you don't, so with, go with web responsive because you have more feedback to get, you can be more agile. But here's the problem that companies So ways, Uber, obvious No, but examples, here's the problem, right? here's the problem. Now I have this debate with the VCs all the time in Silicon Valley, which is if you misfire on the mobile app, on the native, <laughs> you're done. No one's downloading updates really much. So if you don't land and succeed, you're effed. <laughs> because you can't iterate fast, so yeah. agile, the cloud is one of the benefits, and that's, we've done that. Now when you get back and you bake out your use case, we have a bona fide product market fit, then you go native. So, so it's mm -hmm. device, yes, no brainer, and then market fit. So that just takes the risk out of the user, because yeah. no one's, oh yeah, I downloaded that, but it didn't work. And then word gets, so which app did you, no one does which app, it's not responsive. So, so we're seeing that heavily. Well, in, in your world, where's mobile fit? I mean, it's got to be a pretty prominent, right? Yeah, I mean, I think for most of the things that students want from the university revolve around some pretty basic functionality and a lot of information. And so that's really easily delivered via responsive web. And that, that was a decision that we yeah. took. Um, there are, if there are specific use cases where um, we specifically, as you say, need the device and, and, and decide that a mobile app is the right solution, then they'll build mobile I apps. guess if you find yourself made, making too many trade-offs, then that's maybe the time to, as John said, well, so you got to have an Android version, you need an iOS version, uh, and you go native, native, you, you got to build two sets of build yeah, bases, yeah, yeah. the development cycle. It's a big investment, and you, need to really, you really need to need it in yeah. order to make that investment. All right. All right, well, we appreciate you coming on theCUBE. Um, Brian, awesome conversation, uh, geeking out. Um, share with the folks out there, last question, I'll give you the final word. What's the vibe of the show? What's your take um, as someone who's uh, out in the field, a practitioner, customer of ServiceNow, and, but you look at everything else out there, evaluate software, you're a geek, nerd, yep. uh, nerd, I should say. Um, what's, your, what's the vibe? If people aren't in the moment here, what's yeah, the vibe? Sure. I was, I've been to a few of these in my in my career, and I, I got to say, there's a lot of there's definitely a lot of high energy. Um, a really interesting mix, I think, of, of people. There are definitely a very large number of, of nerds. I use that term as a term of endearment. Um, one of my uh, one of my colleagues and I were discussing as we were walking through the corridors what the collective noun for a group of nerds might be, and sort of played around with a few network of nerds. Now we settled on a cloud of nerds. So <laughs> I'd say it's very cloudy. Um, yeah. But that's because there's just a lot of a lot of smart people doing a lot of really interesting. And what's things. the phone of choice for nerds? Uh, Android or iPhone? Well, so <laughs> see, for my generation, and beer. I'm going to ask the beer question too. I, I think I think genuinely, and this really pains me to say, 
the phone choice of nerds is an Android. I think just because it lets them nerd out as much as it they want. It crashes a lot, it, so they get to do a deep, <laughs> deep <laughs> like My personal phone of choice is definitely <laughs> Apple. So I think the, the pseudo nerd used to be a nerd, now in management, that's definitely an iPhone. All right, uh, Brian, one last question. I want to get one more in. Uh, we've got a little bit, we've got a couple seconds left. Sure. Advice to other colleagues out there that around the world that uh, we're looking at this interview and, and want to glean some insight around your experiences that you've learned and, and being on the cutting edge, um, certainly bold move, breaking out on your own, helping other universities. That's the prototype of this new developer model. Hmm. I don't got to get venture funding, I just got to land and expand and create some solutions. So I won't say lifestyle businesses, that's passe, but that, but literally something, be in business. Yeah. Uh, maybe even hit a lucky strike and get you know that Uber effect, but what's your advice to folks watching out there who oh. are really are like in the queue of, I want to go out and do something with this. Uh, look, uh, one of the things that I think the changing model of software has allowed is the ability to build really strong functional apps in quite a short period of time. And in my day when I was writing code for a living, you spent a lot of time doing the underlying stuff, right? And so whether ServiceNow or any number of platforms that are out there, um, you can build the, you know, the icing on top pretty quickly and it doesn't take a huge investment. In fact, if you went to any VCs and said, I want to spend millions and millions of dollars building out this application and underlying stack, they would question your, uh, question your approach. And so I think the opportunity in general is to really look at some of these new generation platforms. Think about where you can, in some cases, totally rethink the way you're running IT in your organization and, and you know, start from the beginning. And if you get lucky, you can maybe build a little bit of a platform-like feature into the icing. Meaning you yeah, can come absolutely. into the market as a tool. Yeah, absolutely. And win, and then expand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity from a commercial perspective. I'm really excited about where ServiceNow is going with its with this application platform and the developer program and things like that because I see it as a perfect opportunity to build some of these functional applications and and monetize them. Building and creating, creating value. Uh, time to beer is what we say in the developer community. Time to value for the customers. Um, what's your favorite beer? Uh, that's a that is a very interesting <laughs> question. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of really good microbrews that have started up in the last sort of five or six years in Australia. Um, I'd say at the moment I do have to come back to an old time home favorite, Anchor Steam from San Fran. So. Uh, we right. finally got it imported into Australia in the last <laughs> six months, and I'm a happy man. Nice. All right, Brian Clark here inside the Cube, uh, sharing, sharing what's going on here at the event, and going, in, going technical, going deep, going under the hood. This is the Cube. We'll be right back after this short break.